In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and the grace to spend this time of prayer fruitfully. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. In the first book of Kings, we read, in those days, Elijah the prophet went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the entrance of the city, a widow was gathering sticks there, and he called out to her, please bring me a small cupful of water to drink. She left to get it, and he called out after her, please bring along a bit of bread. And she answered, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked. There's only a handful of flour in my jar and a little oil in my jug. Just now I was collecting a couple of sticks to go in and prepare something for myself and my son. And when we have eaten it, we shall die. Well, the literal sense of the first reading of today's mass brings us to the time of the prophet Elijah, who was sent by God during the long reign from 873 to 852, that's 19 years or 20, of the idolatrous King Ahab over the northern kingdom of Israel with its capital, Samaria. Ahab, he was infamous. Just like his father, Omri, <laughs> that's where the, the brand for uh, those light bulbs come from, Omri. Ahab carried on a policy of alliances with the kingdoms around, thereby opening the doors of Israel by that time. This is already 800 BC. Remember that the kingdom of David, of Saul, of David, of Solomon, which was a united kingdom, a powerful kingdom, was around the year 1000 to 900. So after Solomon, his sons quarreled, and Israel or Palestine was divided into two, the Northern Kingdom, Israel, with its capital in Samaria, and the Southern Kingdom, Judea, where Jerusalem was, its capital was Jerusalem, where the temple was subsequently built. Well, the Northern Kingdom, farther from, shall we say, the religious leaders, farther from Jerusalem, which was where the Ark was, was brought by David, Ark of the Covenant, the temple, therefore, before it became a, a big temple, of course, it was just a tent at that time, the one built by, by David, were quite unfaithful. Later on, they would become the Samaritans, and that's the reason why the Jews looked down on the Samaritans, because of their long history of alliances with other kingdoms, and therefore opening themselves up to idolatry, which was the biggest sin in the Old Testament, infidelity to God, in the same way that infidelity to one spouse, adultery, it even sounds like alike in English, was also the biggest sin in the relationship with men. So those were the two biggest sins of the Old Testament, idolatry, infidelity with the one God, with the covenant with God, and adultery, infidelity with one spouse, the covenant, the marital or the marriage covenant. But anyway, Ahab, who had a long reign, 19 years, almost 20, was infamous for precisely opening himself up to the neighbors and even marrying a, a um, eventually, therefore, you know, marrying a, a pagan queen, Jezebel. Again, rings a bell, not Jezebel infamous or notorious rather for films, especially of Hollywood in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. was, she was a daughter of the king of the Sidonians, Tyre and Sidon. Remember those coastal towns of the Mediterranean? And as Solomon before him had been influenced by his pagan concubines, he had 700, Ahab fell to worshiping the pagan god Baal and was at the point even of supplanting the, the official religion of the kingdom. But God was watching, as always, over his people and sent the great prophet Elijah, whose name meant 
my God is the Lord. In other words, if all of you claim false gods, my God is the one who is the Lord. That's his name. Thus God sent Elijah to announce to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And a great famine fell on the land. While Elijah was commanded by God to go southwards and to settle in the land east of the Jordan, the Judean wilderness, the same countryside where John the Baptist later on would be, where ravens brought him food while the land of Israel suffered. Let me just turn this thing off. Then the word of the Lord came to him. We read, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded the widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. Zarephath was about 12 kilometers south of Sidon. So in other words, there, uh, beyond Galilee, the Galilee of the Gentiles, as later on that area would be called. Bordering the Mediterranean, there were coastal towns, coastal cities, and as always, given in to all kinds of shenanigans, which is what normally happens in a, in, a, in a port city. Later on, Herod the Great, the Herod of the infancy of our Lord, who was a builder, would build Caesarea Maritima there, um, uh, something like Manila, something like Hamburg, something like, you know, any coastal, coastal city like Hong Kong. Nowadays, the, the scholars or the archaeologists are amazed because it contains, it's amazing that the foundations of the port are made of blocks, huge blocks of maritime cement. It's like Portland cement, but maritime, meaning to say that it can, it can take uh, seawater, in other words. You know? And that's the kind of, um, that was the environment. That was the kind of builder that Herod was. So that's the um, literal sense. And now we go to the spiritual sense, which the Navarre Bible has always explains very well. Jesus, it says, uses the fact that it was a widow and a foreigner who was chosen to show that God gives his gifts to whomever he pleases, not to those who think they have a right to them. As our Lord later on would say, and St. Luke records it, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, the drought and famine, when there came a great famine over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, the woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elijah, and none of them was cleansed, but Naaman the Syrian. The lesson is that grace is absolutely gratuitous. God gives his grace to whom he pleases. As we had seen before, God does not love us because we're lovable. It's the other way around. The initiative always comes from him. He loves and he makes the object of his love lovable. We see that in the account of creation in Genesis, when after every day, each day, which, is, which doesn't mean the 24 hours of our day, but a period of time. After a period of creation, he would look back at what he had created and he would see that he was good. Not that he created something and found out it was good, but rather because it was good in his mind, he wanted it to exist, gave it being. And that's the origin of its first goodness. The most fundamental goodness of anything that exists is what the philosophers call the bonum, uh, the, the good of being, the good of existing. The fact that it exists, it's good because otherwise it wouldn't exist. God wouldn't make it. God is not in the habit of creating things that are hateful to him. He creates things 
that are lovable to him and makes them lovable by putting them in the right order, providing them adequately, giving them their own physical laws, chemical laws, behavioral laws of nature. And the reason why when, that's the reason why when it came to man on the fifth day, on the sixth day rather, because of the perfection that God would put in man, who he creates according to his image, who he elevates to the supernatural order by breathing his own spirit to him, the breath of life. Such that on the sixth day, when he looked back, it says there, and he saw that it was very good, Val de Bonum, a departure from the pattern of the previous periods where he had seen that what he had created was good. In the case of man, it was very good. Man was at the apex of the material world. Next only to the angels, man was what gave pleasure to God the most individually at that, not, not a whole herd of, of men, but one by one, you and me, each one of us, give so much pleasure to God. You are my beloved son. This day, I have begotten you. We see in Psalm 2, ask of me and I shall give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your domain. This was, in fact, what happened at the conclusion of the first reading. Because Elijah, you noticed, he started out asking for a cup of water, and then he asked for bread. And when he was told that they had, he, she had no bread, and she, all she had was a little bit of flour left and a little bit of oil, just enough for her to bake one more unleavened bread, one more pita bread for that day for her and her son. She was a widow. We had seen before how widows in Palestine, in those cultures of the desert, lived a very precarious existence because a woman had no standing in society unless you were the daughter or sister of someone or the spouse. So therefore, a widow, most probably in her case without any relatives, would have no standing. To top it all, she had a son, small boy, most probably. So she, she was not only poor, she was destitute. And all she had was that last bit of flour, last bit of oil, and this stranger was asking for it. But she gave it. She did what she was told. Elijah said to her, do not be afraid. Go and do as you propose to make that one last piece of bread. But first, make me a little cake and bring it to me. Then you can prepare something for yourself and your son. For the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour shall not go empty, nor the jug of oil run dry until the day when the Lord sends rain upon the earth. In other words, she was going to survive on that flour and on that oil for the remainder of the drought. She laughed and did, as Elisha had said, and she and he, and her household ate for many days. The jar of meal was not spent, neither the jug of oil failed, according to the word of the Lord, which she spoke by Elijah. That widow of Zarephath, touched by grace through the prophet Elijah, corresponded with its generosity, giving everything that she had to survive on and gain for herself, her son, and her entire household the further grace of that provision of flour and oil that lasted them the remainder of the drought. This ideal of corresponding to grace with totality is pursued in the gospel reading. When it said that our Lord sat down opposite the treasury and observed how the crowd put money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums, St. Mark recounts, and a poor widow also came and put in two small coins, copper coins, worth a few cents. And calling his disciples to himself, he said to them, Jesus, Amen, I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the other contributors to the treasury. For they have all contributed from their surplus wealth. But she, from her poverty, has contributed all that she had, her whole livelihood. Again, the literal sense, 
the so-called treasury, Gatsophelatium in, in Greek, was actually a storehouse of sorts. Originally, it had been the storehouse to store the tent and what went into it. What tent? Well, the tent of the, the Ark of the Covenant, the tent that they transported the Ark from one place to another. So when finally it arrived in, in, in Jerusalem, brought by David, the last stopover was in uh, Abu Ghosh, very near Saxum. When you go to the Saxum Conference Center now, you'll see a neighboring hill, which is actually the place where you can get a very good picture of Saxum. Well, there's uh, a church there now, the, the Church of the, um, hmm, I think it's called the Church of the Ascension. But anyway, or maybe of the Ark, because that's the, that's the place commemorating the place where David installed the tent with the Ark inside in its last, I don't know, several months, perhaps even year, before he finally transported it to Jerusalem with much fanfare, as we read also in scripture. Well, he was singing and danced in his underwear, really humiliating himself, causing uh, uh, Nicol, the, the son of, or the, the, the daughter of Saul, to despise him. They were married, but she despised him because he was a commoner. Remember, he was a shepherd, and now he is there making a fool of himself, according to her mind, by dancing like that in front of the Ark of the Covenant as it entered Jerusalem. It was all he could do. In his simplicity, remember, he was a shepherd. It was all he could do to honor his God. Well, um, that was that place, the so-called treasury, originally was some kind of a bodega where they, they store these things. And later on, it became a storehouse for supplies donated to the temple. Well, at the time of our Lord, that had become really a storehouse, which is... Uh, um, situated or built in the uh, courtyard of the women because the, 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 the temple of Jerusalem was like concentric rectangles but if you have a rectangle not concentric in the center concentric towards one end in that end forming a square was the holy of holies there is the ark of the covenant only the high priest could go there and only on certain days on other days, uh, the, one of the priests would be assigned to offer incense there also. That's the, the uh, site of the, the appearance of the Archangel Gabriel to Zachary, remember, because Zachary was one of the priests and it was his turn to offer incense. And it was there in the Holy of Holies. Okay, so that's the Holy of Holies. And then you had the court, yard of the men only men could go there jewish men that is and then you had the courtyard of the women mm -hmm. women could enter there jewish women and then you have the courtyard of the gentiles well, the courtyard of the gentiles you can liken it to uh, the parking lot and the external part the street of baclaran where everybody was there the uh, the uh, kiosks and the merchants were there selling all kinds of, of wear, including things necessary for uh, the sacrifice. But the gods of Philatium, or the, the storehouse, the, the storage, the treasury, was in the atrium or in the courtyard of the women. That's the reason why the widow could go there. She had access to it. That's the literal sense. And what did our Lord make use of in order to give us a lesson? A lesson of generosity, akin to what had happened to the widow of Seraphat, who gave everything, her whole substance, at the disposition of the prophet, the messenger from God. Now this widow would put everything that she had for that day at least. A couple of copper coins, 
which was her livelihood for that day. And she could beg to follow for the following day or for the rest of the day. I don't know. But as far as she was concerned, she gave everything. And our Lord called or taught his disciples that, that all those rich people, they had given a lot more, absolutely speaking in absolute terms, than that poor widow. But they had given the surplus from their abundance, their coins, their baria, as we would call it in Tagalog. But she, she gave everything that she had. The lesson here is very important because grace, grace comes from God. It's God's initiative. So we cannot measure it quantitatively or according to our terms. God knows what kind of grace he gives to each one. First of all, the sanctifying grace, which is the presence of the Holy Spirit, the blessed Trinity in the soul of the person who is in the state of grace. You cannot say, that God is more or less present. Either he's present or he's not. If he's present, that person is, we say he's in the state of grace, sanctifying grace. But if he commits something incompatible with the presence of God in his soul, then God is, he ejects God. So God is not, God cannot be present halfway. It can't be like that. There was this, there was this young lady many years ago who came to me in the, and said, Father, I think I'm medio pregnant. <laughs> what do you mean you're medio pregnant? You're either pregnant or you're not, but you can't be medio pregnant, right? So that's it. Either we have God in our soul in the state of grace, or we don't, and we don't have him, or in the state of sin. But then that presence, as far as God is concerned, is totally present. But as far as we're present, we are concerned. As far as the person is concerned, that presence admits of degrees. Degrees of efficacy, degrees of manifestation. A person who is, do who is docile would manifest that presence more. A person who is not docile would keep the Holy Spirit really cramped up. I can imagine the Holy Spirit in physical terms. In a person who is not generous, he's there. Very little activity. Hmm? But to the person who's generous, who's prayerful, who knows how to say yes all the time, I can almost picture the Holy Spirit dancing, displaying everything that he can do. And he gets, I second the motion, I second the motion. Be it done unto me according to thy word. And the Holy Spirit does a lot of words. Why? Because the model, the goal, of that reconfiguration that he's trying to accomplish in our soul with our correspondence, he just initiates, he just creates scenarios. He even puts a little push with actual graces, but we are the ones who act it out. It's like a dance instructor is just giving the steps, whispering them even, and we are the ones executing the steps. The more we're docile, then the more he gives. Instead of just, I don't know, a simple uh, one step forward, two steps back, or vice versa, he starts giving us all these steps that, that twin um, America's Got Talent. Hmm? That's what happens with sanctifying grace. But to a certain extent, that's also what happens with actual graces. Those many impulses that come up in the course of any given day in a con continuous stream, one actual grace after another, corresponding to every scenario, to every circumstance, I would even say every pandemic and whatever happens within it. But it needs correspondence. That those two widows had their opportunities and they corresponded totally. In the case of the widow of Sarephath, we saw what happened. Sometimes, you know, one gets the, the feeling of complaining a little bit with the Holy Spirit. You know? Couldn't you have written a little bit more? Because I really wonder what happened to the widow of Jerusalem, the one that our Lord saw and praised. 
the one who gave everything. Did the similar miracle happen in her life? I don't doubt it. But that's the, the adventure of ordinary life. Those are the miracles that are recorded anywhere. And even if we complain to the Holy Spirit, why didn't you record that one? Well, God always knows what he's doing and he knows better. And come to think of it, Christianity has moved forward. You and I are here, you and I are still here, even without that having been recorded. You see, because that's what God does. He can put everything so blatantly, as shall we say, obvious. Because then where would be the faith? Where would be our faith? Where would be our chance to make our act of faith even if there's no physical evidence? And there's a priest who I love so much and respect so much. One of the first ones in the Philippines was author of the book there, The Hidden God. And the whole thesis of the book is precisely that. Why couldn't God have made himself felt have made his presence more obvious so that it's really at your face and nobody can deny and nobody can, shall we say, squirrel away. And that's precisely the point. Because one, God wants to respect our freedom. God wants us to make an act of faith freely. Because if everything were that clear, then it wouldn't be faith. It would be physical certainty, physical evidence, the kind of certainty I have that I'm a man, for example. It's physical, right? But the act of faith is not physical certainty. The act of faith is based on the witness of God, of Jesus Christ talking. That's why freely, we can deny it. There's no compelling evidence to make that act of faith. And therein is the merit. Because even without that compelling evidence, freely, because we want to, we make that act of faith. And that's what has happened in salvation history. All the players and shakers and changers of salvation history, all those who have made, made it work, and not only the big ones, but the daily ones, you. Each one of you, you're making salvation history work in your own family, in your own environment, with your own friends, because of the things you're learning from these meditations, from your own meditation, the resolutions that you make at the end of this meditation and which you will put into practice the whole day. Those are the shakers. You are the shakers and the movers. But no, it all depends on whether you want to or not. It all depends on whether you correspond and you correspond fully or half-heartedly. We need to end. And perhaps we can end again with those words of St. Cosa Maria, which I told you before already, are one of my favorite passages of the way. Many great things depend on forgetting, on whether you and I live our lives as God wants. Perhaps the, the contemplation of the, of the scenes, the widow of Serephath and the widow of Jerusalem that our Lord observed, could put a little bit of nuance there on whether you and I give ourselves fully, on whether you and I correspond to God's initiatives fully, not half-heartedly, on whether you and I are willing to play it all, giving our substance, Many great things depend. I think you have five minutes left to finish the prayer. Mm -hmm.